Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And welcome to today's grassroots conference call with the CCAN Action Fund and the Virginia Sierra Club about the Virginia Clean Economy Act. My name is Stacey Miller, and I'm the Digital Campaigns Coordinator at CCAN. I want to update you on a few housekeeping items before turning the call over to our speakers. First off, today's call is being recorded. We can make a recording available to you at your request. Second, after hearing from our speakers, we will open the call up to your questions. You may email your question in at any time during this call. To do so, email your question to info at ccanactionfund.org. Again, that's info at ccanactionfund.org. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to CCAN's director, Mike Tidwell. Thank you, Stacy, and welcome everyone to this statewide call about the Virginia Clean Economy Act. Again, I'm Mike Tidwell, Executive Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and CCAN Action Fund. And we are really excited about this call. We have folks from all over the state on the call tonight, from Hampton Roads to Nova to the Valley to Richmond and Southwest and everywhere in between. And we're really excited to be here to discuss by far the strongest climate and clean energy bill ever to have the prospect of final passage in the Virginia General Assembly. Last week, both the House and Senate passed strong versions of the Clean Economy Act, and now the bill must be reconciled with the opposite chamber and sent to the governor. As you'll hear from our speakers in a moment, this bill would effectively shut down all of Dominion's coal-fired power plants in Virginia by the year 2030 and all the state's utility-owned gas plants no later than 2045 in the House passed version of the bill. The bill mandates that at least 40 percent of the state's non-nuclear grid come from renewable electricity by 2030 and 100 percent by 2050, and that puts Virginia in the ballpark of states like California and Maryland. It also commits half a billion dollars in energy efficiency investments in low-income households by 2030. In a moment, you'll hear from our featured call speakers and supporters of the bill, including Delegate Rip Sullivan, who is Democratic House Caucus Chair and Vice Chair of the Labor and Commerce Committee. He is also Chief Patron of the Clean Economy Act. Then we'll hear from Bob Shippey, Legislative Chair of the Virginia Chapter of the Sierra Club, and Harrison Wallace, who is Virginia State Director of CCAN and CCAN Action Fund. Other supporters of this bill are just too many to name here, but they include the Virginia League of Conservation Voters, Southern Environmental Law Center, the Virginia Energy Efficiency Council, and virtually every state-based and regional wind and solar power company operating in Virginia. The bill has also been endorsed by the progressive website Blue Virginia. Again, both House and Senate chambers passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act last week with the House version, House Bill 1526, having stronger features that are supported by Sierra and CCAN and the governor's office and other supporters over the still strong Senate version, Senate Bill 851. The House features include a robust energy efficiency goal that Dominion must meet by 2025. Supporters hope to get the stronger House version to the governor's desk by early March, which he has said he wants to sign. Before I introduce our first speaker, I also want to tell you again what Stacy mentioned earlier, and that is we want to hear from you. If you have a question for any of our speakers, please email your questions to info at ccanactionfund.org. That's info at ccanactionfund.org. And I just want to check, Delegate Sullivan, are you on the call? I'm here, Mike. Oh, fantastic. Uh, well, you just heard the voice, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the delegate. Uh, it's my honor to introduce him as our first speaker tonight. Uh, Delegate Rip Sullivan uh, represents the 48th District in Northern Virginia. Delegate Sullivan has served in the Virginia House since 2014 and has been a leading advocate for climate action, especially around the vital issue of energy efficiency. Again, he now serves as House Caucus Leader and is Chief Patron of the Clean Economy Act. Delegate Sullivan. Well, thank you, Mike, and good evening, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here uh, chatting with you folks. Uh, you know, Mike said I've been working on these issues 
since I got into the General Assembly, and, and that is true. I have to say there's a, a big difference working from the majority uh, rather <laughs> than, than the minority. I, uh, I, 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 I tell this story all the time. When I <clears throat> first got to the General Assembly uh, and started talking about energy efficiency, uh, and over the years, I've sort of established myself as the General Assembly's sort of energy efficiency nerd. But in any event, I, I was appearing in front of the what's called the Energy Subcommittee, and uh, at the time it was being chaired by uh, Delegate Kilgore uh, from the 1st District. <clears throat> and I had a, a bill for uh, an EERS, and I got up and I barely opened my mouth when before Delegate Kilgore looked at me and said, Delegate Sullivan, Tell me why Dominion should be worried about whether the Kilgore children turn their lights out at night. And I knew I was in for a very long, long hearing, uh, and it didn't go particularly well. But I, but I have to say that even even from the minority side over the course of the last six or seven years, you know, finally we're getting traction, frankly, from both sides of the aisle, particularly on energy efficiency and sort of the realization that it is the fastest, cheapest uh, way for us to to re- reduce our our carbon output, our carbon footprint, uh, and one of the things I'm most excited about uh, with the uh, uh, Clean Economy Act is a really strong EERS. You know, everyone knows right now we've got a we're, we're doing we've made some progress on energy efficiency in Virginia, but we're way behind everybody else, and, and we don't have a mandatory program. Uh, the EERS that's in the in the House bill, and I, and I expect we're going to be able to get into the Senate bill. Um, uh, is very aggressive and, and would, would launch Virginia from the back of the pack uh, up toward the front of the pack uh, in terms of energy efficiency efforts. And <laughs> frankly, the same is true for much of the rest of the bill. It also has a mandatory RPS in it, uh, uh, which, which again is uh, going to sort of ignite Virginia's uh, solar uh, uh, and other renewable uh, industries, you know, everyone knows we're, we're sort of lagging behind not just our neighbors, but states all around the country. Uh, and uh, the, the, this bill will will launch us, uh, you know, toward the toward the front. I've been using words like transformative and, frankly, even historic uh, to describe uh, the VCEA. And and I don't think that's I don't think that's uh, hyperbole. Um, uh, it, you know, it's not perfect bill and. Uh, since I got to the General Assembly, I, you know, I've, I've yet to see the perfect bill. But frankly, because of a lot of people's hard work, both in the elections last year, um, frankly, particularly because of the elections last year, um, but also leading up to this session, uh, the, the, the group of people that have been working with me uh, and Senator McClellan, who's the chief patron over on the Senate side, uh, have just been working tirelessly to, to craft this piece of legislation. And, you know, uh, those those who've been resistant to these sorts of things in the past, and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, um, I'm talking, of course, about about uh, Dominion. Uh, realize that it's a new world, uh, given what happened in last year's elections. I know there are a lot of people on the phone uh, to whom I owe a great uh, debt of gratitude for their hard work last November uh, to to get us this democratic majority both in the house and the senate and and uh that has changed the game and uh dominion uh is going to have to swallow some things uh that it never dreamed it would have to swallow uh and um we're making real we're making real progress so i, I I'll, I'll finish with this I, I don't know how much time we have mike but I, I can say to the people on the phone literally the next three or four or five days are going to be uh, we'll set the fate of the VCEA. Um, the bill keeps changing, and I know that some people in the uh, in the environmental movement find that frustrating. Um, but sometimes, I mean, that's just sort of the way things work here in, in Richmond. The bill keeps changing, but I think it keeps changing for the better. Um, and uh, uh, but I will be in front of the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee. I think as early as Monday with what will have to be probably the final version of the bill, uh, or at least close to it. Uh, and then the House will be considering the Senate's version uh, maybe as early as Tuesday, but certainly no no later than Thursday. So the next, literally the next several days in Richmond are going to be crucial. So to the extent this is a an opportunity for me to 
to ask for for yet you know yet again ask for more help. Um, get on your phones, uh, send your emails, activate your networks because um, this bill, uh, the, the, the future of the VCEA will be decided quite literally over the next several days here in Richmond. Uh, and I think we've got a great opportunity to do something that will that, uh, frankly, just a year ago, we couldn't have dreamed of doing here in Virginia. I'm very excited about it. And uh, let me just end with one more thank you to everyone on the phone, because I know that this is uh, this has become uh, you know, a real statewide, if, if not even a national effort. We're, we're here, people all over the country are excited about what Virginia might be able to do. Finally, uh, uh, Virginia's just been so far behind, and and to, to be able to to, to to be on the cusp of, of success with a bill that's gonna, you know, it's 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 an omnibus bill, which both makes it very exciting, but also a real challenge because it. Uh, it, it, it has the potential to do so much, but you know, between the mandatory ERS, and mandatory RPS, um, obviously uh, offshore wind, uh, and the bill has uh, you know, lots and lots of consumer protections built into it, and a real focus on issues having to do with environmental justice. Um, we all recognize that as we move away from a carbon-based economy, uh, we have to keep in mind. Uh, neighborhoods and populations that uh, uh, you know that have suffered in the past and that and that will will need some help trans- during this transition time. And the bill has a lot of that built into it too. So uh, we we've 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 uh, taken on a big task. It's a heavy lift, but it, it's just remarkable to see the progress we've made. And I am grateful to everyone on the phone for their interest and for what I know has been a great effort in terms of organizing and uh, uh, and and. Uh, mobilizing you know, constituents, talking to members, because I get a lot of members walking up to me telling, you know, telling me they've, they've heard from constituents in support of the bill. So I'll stop talking, Mike. I'm happy to take questions or, or listen to your next speakers. Well, uh, Delegate Rip Sullivan, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being chief patron of the Clean Economy Act uh, and for serving as chair of the House Labor and Commerce Committee. Um, if you are able to stick around, uh, we are going to uh, hand it off to Bob Shippey of Sierra Club next and then Harrison and then open it up to to questions. Um, if you're able to stick around, that would be wonderful. Sure, I'd be happy to. Fantastic. Um, so we'll turn next to our, our next speaker, Bob Shippey. Bob is legislative chair of the Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club, and he will speak to us for a few moments on how we got to this moment in Virginia clean energy politics and the role that grassroots activists, like many of you on this call, have played and that Delegate Rip Sullivan also referred to. Bob? Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thank you, Delegate uh, Sullivan. You're a tough act to follow. A lot of the points that I want to emphasize uh, you've touched on, but but I'll, I'll try to amplify them without being repetitive. Uh, I am a, a volunteer leader here with the Virginia chapter of Sierra Club um, on the political committee side as well as the legislative side, but I'll, I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, I, you know, like probably everybody on this call, um, I'm in this to, to help move the Commonwealth forward uh, to a, a cleaner energy. And, uh, I've probably been in various protests with many of you <laughs> over the years. Um, I know I have with Harrison and Mike, um, and for the been pretty involved in the General Assembly efforts of the chapter, along with uh, Karina Bell and others in, in the in the chapter. And I, I really have to say that where we stand right now in the GA does show the power of grassroots. Um, actions, uh, both in the political and the legislative arenas. So, um, you know, Delegate Sullivan mentioned the election. Getting a new majority in both chambers cannot be understated here. Um, that really has enabled us to have conversations that, uh, if we had them at all in the past, um, were kind of futile, and, and they, might be, uh, they might be embodied in, in the message or start a conversation, that kind of thing, uh, whereas now we're actually putting forward that uh, that have a good chance to pass, and that's a very different feeling, and it, it, it's a complete shift in power in the building as well um, in terms of, you know, progressive ideas having, uh, having a chance, um, and frankly, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but frankly, putting Dominion on their heels uh, in, in many regards. 
Um, you know, I would I would say that, uh, and by the way, that's a very good feeling because that's, <laughs> that's the opposite of how every other session has gone where uh, I can never remember the utilities coming in kind of on their heels. The only moment that, that, that I can recall was in 2018, and I know Delegate Sullivan remembers this, uh, with the Grid Transformation Act, which many of us had mixed feelings about, but the, the worst element of that bill was um, sort of the double dip effect where Dominion was able to collect twice on certain investments. And uh, this grassroots upswell of, of, uh, of calls and, and emails and in-person visits, we were able to defeat that piece of that bill. Uh, and that was a victory. And, and I, I did see the look in, in the Dominion lobbyist's eyes then that I now see pretty regularly in the building. So uh, I wanted to mention that. But Clean Economy Act is, is probably the best example of this power shift that I, that I can cite of any of the bills that, uh, that we've been working on uh, this session. Um, you know, it kind of started um, late last summer is when I became aware of some of the clean economy um, companies, uh, the advanced energy um, economy group largely, but also joined quickly by some of the solar, uh, solar installers and so on. Um, I know that um, the Southern Environmental Law Center got involved uh, fairly early in the game because they have the attorneys that, um, that have the expertise to really make sure the legislation is smartly drafted. And soon after that, I, I know Sierra Club and CCAN and others um, joined the conversations. And this was all before the election. So um, we were hopeful that we could um, propose uh, an omnibus bill like this. But frankly, um, you know, it was aspirational at that point. Then the election happened, and, uh, you know, our aspirations became real in a sense uh, that we were able to pull this, uh, this bill together and actually get it filed with the delegates' help and, and of course, Senator McClellan, as we, uh, as we just mentioned. Um, I, I think you probably know the, the, the basics of the bill, but, and, and Harrison will go into this in more detail later, but uh, you've got these four large pillars that, that make it up, the, the mandatory RPS that uh, Delegate Sullivan mentioned, the uh, mandatory energy efficiency standard, a lot of great solar provisions, and, of course, then the, uh, the carbon reduction piece of it, which is uh, kind of revolving around Reggie, but it goes further than that. I mean, for years, mm -hmm. we have tried to get any of these pieces passed as individual bills, and we've never gotten too much traction. Um, now we've got a bill that has all four of them in it, and that, as, as Rip mentioned, you know, we are still trying to strengthen this bill. Um, we now have uh, help from the administration on that. I do want to mm -hmm. mention that because they have, um, they have jumped in and helped us strengthen this. Uh, in past sessions, you know, I would see bills get worse as the session went on. And this time I would agree with the delegates' comments that it's gotten better. So um, I will uh, hand it back to our, our CCAN brethren. But um, I do, I do want to thank those of you on the phone uh, in your efforts over the years, not just now, but over the years, to make sure that we got better uh, representation in Richmond and then that we continue to put pressure on our um, to get the very best policy that we can through these uh, – through the chambers. Thanks much. Back to you, Mike. Thank you. That was, again, Bob Shippey, who is legislative chair of the Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club and was one of the many uh, folks who rolled up their sleeves over many weeks and helped write the bill that is now the Virginia Clean Economy Act. And if you want to read more about the bill and fact sheets related to the bill and what other publications are saying about the bill, you can check out the blog of our next speaker, Harrison Wallace, at our website, ccanactionfund.org. It's the first blog on the page, so that's ccanactionfund.org. You'll also see there, again, at the end of Harrison's blog, uh, a link to a fact sheet about the bill and also posts from Blue Virginia and a very thorough but I think fair uh, piece by Virginia uh, the Virginia Mercury, a uh, very uh, uh, solid um, third-party uh, review of, of the bill. Um, now uh, I'll hand it over to Harrison Wallace himself. Harrison is Virginia State Director of CCAN and the CCAN Action Fund, and he will talk in more detail about the major pillars of the bill and ongoing measures to make the bill even stronger. Harrison. Hey, thanks, Mike, um, and thank you, Delegate Sullivan and Bob, for 
kicking this off. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a bit about the policy um, and go a tiny bit in the weeds. And hopefully, you know, if you have any other questions on it, uh, you know, feel free to ask. I do encourage you to look at the, the Mercury article as well for an, an objective uh, and thorough review of the bill. And like the delegate said, um, this bill is changing. Um, I'm going to focus on the House bill, which is a more ambitious and um, a vehicle that we're really excited about. And I think we're, we, we are hoping to make even more improvements on um, next week when we're presenting um, those bills in crossover. So what I want to start with is uh, the, the centerpiece of the bill. And, you know, my, I think Delegate Sullivan is a great uh, chief patron for it, and that's energy efficiency. So, you know, the, the, the whole uh, thing, the, the way we look at this whole bill is that it's an energy efficiency first piece of legislation. Um, we do that through uh, our EERS, the Energy Efficiency Resource Standard, uh, where we'll get uh, 5% of cumulative savings by 2025 on energy bills. So that's money going right back into your pockets. Um, and then the SEC will approve uh, even more um, savings heading into another three-year period after that. Um, so these, these savings are going to end up uh, equaling out to $17 a month in savings on your energy bill. Um, so we're going to talk more about cost, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, on the Internet and, and just all over the place on this bill, a lot of different things on it. But I just want to start with how we formed this bill was to make sure that people are saving money um, by, by making energy efficiency a mandated resource through the EERS, and then also making it an energy efficiency first bill where the SEC is directed um, and utilities are directed to look at ways to where they can reduce demand before they try to build another uh, gas plant or any other type of uh, power plant in the Commonwealth. So I'm really excited about that pillar um, and really looking forward to making mandated savings um, a, a, a pillar of, of what Virginia does um, on the clean energy space. And just going back a little bit to what Bob said, in the Grid Transformation Security Act, the only way we were able to get energy efficiency into a bill that Dominion wrote was through them spending money. This is, a, this is a, an example of how this is a bill written by people who care about climate change and by um, folks who are trying to make sure the clean energy business is much more than just Dominion. Um, and that was done through having something that they would never want in the bill, which is mandated savings instead of mandated spending. Um, the next part uh, that's a bit really important pillar of the bill is a renewable portfolio standard. So this bill will uh, mandate that we get to 100% clean energy. Um, the House bill has Dominion doing that by 2045. Um, and APCO, a smaller utility in the more southwest Virginia, by 2050. So complete clean energy by 2050 earlier for uh, the, the millions of people in Dominion's network. Um, and this is done through uh, mandated uh, build-outs of clean energy, that's wind and solar, um, and then just a tiered system of bringing up uh, renewables each year to get us to that standard. Um, and I think, you know, the bill isn't perfect. The RPS isn't perfect. We are working to make it more perfect, um, but I think, as I said in my blog, uh, this is, I think, the biggest first step I've ever seen on climate. And just to give us a little bit of a picture here, this will get us over 40% of our non-nuclear load uh, to, be renew to be clean energy. And in Maryland, uh, where uh, my boss, Mike, has been working really hard to make them a leader on climate, uh, they passed the bill last year to get to 50% by 2030. And that was, I think, their third or fourth try on the RPS. So for us to do that in the first time with a clean energy majority is setting us up to go way past that in the future. Um, because this is, even when we pass this, we are not done. Um, the, and, and that kind of, you know, that pillar gets into expanding wind and solar by mandating that as the resource of the future so that we'll have um, up to 17,000 new uh, megawatts of new wind and solar by 2035. So that will power millions of homes and create tons of jobs in Hampton Roads with the solar, I mean, with the, uh, the wind array. And then the part that gets us at CCAN super excited is ending fossil fuel emissions. 
So building new clean energy is important. It's great. We, we have to have this to make sure that our grid is sustainable. But in order for us to combat climate change, we have to end the emissions. So this bill was the only bill in the General Assembly that made sure that all fossil fuel emissions are ended. Um, and in the, uh, the mandate said in, in the House version, that's by 2045. So eliminating fossil fuel emissions through a, um, a program that a lot of you know called REGI um, is the first step. So joining REGI to make sure we're getting 30% reductions by 2030 and then extending that out to 2045 and getting everything down to zero of percent emissions um, is an important part of this. Um, we also got rid of biomass uh, in the 2031 through 2045 Reggie period so that that, that fuel is not uh, omitted from the carbon reduction cap. Um, and then the other side of this is that we have mandated uh, closures of fossil fuel plants in this bill. So uh, Dominion's coal plants um, are going to be retired by 2030. So they're already not running at a high level. Um, this will make sure they're off the grid and not polluting a lot of a lot of vulnerable communities that live near them um, in the next decade. And then all their gas plants have to be shut off by 2045, um, which is going to make it near, economically nearly impossible for anyone to think that they should build something that has a 30-year lifespan that has to be shut off by 2045. Um, so that's just another way that we're making sure that the current fossil fuel emissions that are worsening climate change, now the end date, um, and that that is all before 2050, and that the dirtiest of all of them, coal, is uh, getting shut down over the next decade. So we're really excited about that, um, and, and just having that, having that set is really the end of the fossil fuel industry, we believe, in Virginia. Um, and then the, you know, the other pillar that I really wanted to talk about is just how environmental justice fits into this bill. Um, really all over it, um, there's, there's a new provision that wasn't in the introduced one that uh, showed up in the House bill and the Senate bill, and that's the percentage um, of income payment plan or PIP program. Um, this program allows for low-income Virginians to have a capped uh, energy bill that matches uh, 6% of their income if it's not electric heat, 10% of it's electric heat, um, and provides a bit of a cushion for a lot of people who are facing really hard energy burdens, especially in the winter um, when it's really cold and they have to turn on their heat a whole bunch. Um, so this can help protect people. We've seen that cities with the highest energy burdens have some of the lowest poverty rates and also some of the highest eviction rates. So by giving people a little bit of uh, peace of mind of knowing that their energy bill won't go over a certain level. And then the great thing about this program is after a year of seeing where those folks are, we can go in and make sure that there are um, energy efficiency upgrades so that we're actually fixing the problem that's making them use so much energy in the first place. So really excited about that. Also, uh, low-income people don't have to pay for some of the new projects like the, the wind build-out which also is not putting a burden on them. Um, and historically disadvantaged communities are really highlighted in this bill by uh, especially a couple enactment clauses, making sure that environmental, there's an environmental justice review every three years that we see how the program is doing, if it's affecting uh, community, vulnerable communities, and what we can do to fix that. And the Council on Environmental Justice is collaborating on all of these uh, as we've now codified that. Uh, with a new law so that they'll be around forever. Um, and then also there is language in here to make it the policy of the Commonwealth. So any agency um, that's putting together a new job training program or putting together uh, a clean energy uh, resource permit is looking at these frontline communities, um, looking at communities near coal fields, um, and seeing if, if this can benefit them and putting them first in line to get these things. Um, and this would make it a policy to where they're going to look at them first. So um, those are just some of the exciting things in this bill. Um, obviously, I think it will get better, uh, meaning that it can get better. And the most important part is that we're not done. Um, this is something that I think will launch us into a new realm in kind of the ranking of, of clean energy states in Virginia. Um, but we'll, we still will have more work to do, but at least now we have a lot of the infrastructure we need to be able to win this race against the climate crisis. 
Um, so that is a quick synopsis of the bill. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Again, I encourage you to go and read what we wrote about it. Mike wrote a little bit more about the bill on our blog as well. And, uh, and then, of course, the Mercury piece. Um, and as Delegate Sullivan said, I really encourage you to reach out to your legislators to ask them to support it and show up in support of it uh, at committee, uh, especially in what looks like it'll be Monday in at Commerce and Labor. Hey, hey Mike, this is Rip. Let me, let me just say that uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's been a crazy session, and, and this bill has been my, my principal focus, but it's really been comforting and, uh, and very helpful to always look out into the committee room and see Bob and Harrison there. Uh, ready to ready to, to to help us out on this bill and back me up. It's a, it's a nice feeling to see them out there, all around the building helping. So I appreciate their efforts. And Delia Sullivan, I, I I wonder if we could just switch to to questions now. From uh, I, I frequently ask question. And by the way, if you if you want to submit your question again, we're about to take questions emailed to us at info at ccanactionfund.org. That's info at ccanactionfund.org. Uh, but Delegate Sullivan, I think you're in the best position to answer a, a frequently asked question over the last few weeks, and that is, who wrote the bill? There, there are some folks that think that there's no way that Dominion would yield so much on, on renewables after a history of fighting us on renewables and being pro-coal and pro-gas, that how could Domin how could a bill like this get passed unless Dominion wrote it in a way that games the ratepayers and ultimately probably hurts the environment? So you're in the best position to know, how did this bill get written? Uh, well, this bill, <laughs> the, as I indicated earlier, the bill is still being written. But, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that this bill – has been written um, by a coalition of environmental groups, first and foremost, uh, that's really unprecedented in scope and depth. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the Virginia Poverty Law Center's at the table, SELC's at the table, NRDC's at the table, AEEE's at the table. Um, I've been at the table. Um, uh, CCAN, of course, at the table. Sierra Club at the table. LCV at the table. Um, it, it, it just, uh, uh, you know, a, a really deep, deep uh, group of, of, of stakeholders that have never really been in a position to be in one room uh, and, and come up with a bill. Now, you know, coalition building is, is, uh, is really hard, um, uh, but it's gone, frankly, just remarkably well. And these are all people who all want to get to the same place. And so uh, one thing you're not going to hear me do is take credit for drafting this bill. I've been sort of – then Senator McClellan and I, you know, sort of at the, you know, at the top of the pyramid, if you will. But there have been a lot, of, lot, a lot of people much smarter than I um, actually, you know, coming up with the, with the technical details. Um, and picking up on something that uh, you know, Harrison was saying, um, when, when we – uh, I guess the word would be presented this bill to Dominion. Now, this was a, this was it's not a finished product. Uh, you know, the, the bill was the bill was a uh, you know, it was a bill when when we uh, sort of said to Dominion, here's where we're headed. Um, now the, Dominion recognizes that it's in a it's in a new it's in a new world and. Well, I don't want to overplay it. It's not like Dominion is not a, a, an influential force here in Richmond any longer. It's not like they've gone away. Um, but they know, uh, and the story the story Bob told is absolutely right. Uh, two years ago when we had 49 members rather than 55 is when uh, you know, Dominion started to see some cracks in its armor, if you will. And that vote that Bob was talking about really was remarkable. We called it the power of 49. We had you know, 49, <laughs> not quite a majority. Um, but we were able to win a vote uh, that, you know, frankly, Dominion had never lost a vote like that. And um, when we passed this out of the House, this, the VCEA out of the House a couple weeks ago, uh, Dominion had never seen a bill like this pass out of the House of Delegates, and it's never seen a bill like this pass out of the Senate. Um, so the, the ground has shifted under them. Um, and so they, uh, I guess what I'm suggesting to you, Mike, is that they came They came to this negotiating table uh, in a much weakened position. 
Um, and uh, you know, if I can if I can hold my 55 votes together, Senator McClellan can hold her 21 votes together. Um, we're in a position to 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 do things that just I, I, just a year ago before the election we couldn't have dreamed of doing. Thank you, Delegate. And and our next question. This is a specific question from uh, a listener on the phone. Uh, and uh, the question is, and I direct this to Harrison and Bob. Um, is this is, is there any opportunity to include a meaningful fossil fuel moratorium in the VCEA? My communities are never going to support a bill which allows continued frack gas build out. So that is a question that we've heard, a version of that question we've heard frequently. Um, I guess the question I'd have to uh, Bob and then maybe Harrison is, is this bill a de facto moratorium? Uh, and is there a possibility of having a formal moratorium on fossil fuels later? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike, uh, and I've heard that too. Um, I think it is a de facto moratorium, and I say that for two reasons. Uh, uh, part of the bill, uh, if folks have seen it, um, is that the um, administration is tasked with doing a review of capacity energy needs uh, that will be done over the next, um, well, really, it's going to be almost two years away when, when the deadline is, I think, Harrison, correct me if I'm wrong, and no fossil fuel in infrastructure can be built out in that time. Uh, and then, depending on the results of that report, um, there that would have to be jumped through um, to propose any new fossil fuel infrastructure. The, the utilities would have to be meeting all their energy efficiency targets, their manda mandated renewable portfolio targets, and uh, and they'd have to be able to demonstrate that there's no other way to meet the capacity but for the new fossil infrastructure. And even then. Uh, they would have to meet, you know, as Harrison alluded to a minute ago, um, sort of the, the cost-benefit analysis of doing that when they know it would be phased out within, say, you know, 20 years hence. Um, I think the, that common would make it virtually impossible to justify any new fossil fuel um, plants. Uh, Mike, yeah, this is yeah, let, me just, let, let me just say, I, I, oh, go ahead. I think that with the beauty of the VCA, one of the beauties of the VCA, and, and I think this is what Bob was getting at, is that it shifts it shifts the market forces within Virginia. Um, and he's right about the, the sort of the initial uh, couple of years where uh, there is a, there is essentially a moratorium because of the way the, the, the bill is drafted. Um, and, and what it does is it changes all the economics of energy in Virginia over the course of the next 30 years. And as a practical economic matter, it will no longer be possible to profitably build a fossil fuel plant in Virginia. And the way the market will be shifted by this, by this transformative bill will you know, force any profit-making entity uh, to be looking uh, at, at renewable ways to produce energy rather than fossil fuel ways. Thank you, Delia. And we have tons of questions, and so I'm, I'm just going to shift gears and direct this question to you, Harrison. Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, the question is, uh, as Delegate Sullivan noted, the bill is changing, uh, and, uh, but he believes the bill is getting better. Uh, can he or others explain what positive changes are being made right now? And are there any ways in which the bill is not improving? Harrison? Sure. Um, I mean, the main way that the bill is changing in a positive way right now is that we are continuing to see more and more oversight from the SEC getting inserted into the bill um, and, and just in general, just more ways to make sure that this is uh, the most responsible way to build clean energy. Um, I think that's what we've all been working towards, and um, now especially with the administration leaning in a little bit more, we're starting to see. Um, and then just from the House version, like there, there is, you know, there was a, another like actual moratorium uh, enactment clause added in there. If people are meeting their Reggie goals by 2028, um, and then more uh, worker provisions for local workers uh, to be included in uh, any any future. 
uh, build out of new fossil fuel. I mean, no, I'm sorry, no, no new fossil fuels, a new uh, of new uh, clean energy, um, and especially new offshore wind. Um, so those are those are some of the ways I think it's getting better. Um, I haven't seen how it's gotten worse. I think what we'll just have to watch out for is that, of course, you know, Dominion isn't liking a lot of these changes and will try to fight them. So I think making sure that there are people standing up in support of them and giving, uh, you know, brave legislators like Delegate Sullivan the opportunity to, to support it and know that they have some backup. And great. Thank you, Harrison. And Delegate Sullivan, we've got several versions of the same question, and that is – You've said that the bill is not perfect. There are a lot of positive features. But if the bill is imperfect, will the Virginia General Assembly be able to come back in subsequent years and improve this bill? Or in a regulated market, is Dominion likely to uh, dominate and control any imperfections going forward at the expense of ratepayers? Uh uh, the, the answer to the latter question is is no, um, and the answer to the first question is yes. You know, the first thing you come you learn when you come to Richmond um, is uh, you know, sometimes even the best ideas take a little time to marinate. I, I can't remember whether it was Bob or or, uh, or Harrison who, who uh, pointed out that one of the things that's been unique about the VCEA is, is sort of the speed with which we've been able to get to this point. Um, but I have a saying when it comes to a bill that either fails or a bill that isn't quite as good as you want, uh, I always tell people, you know, this is why God invented next year. Um, we will be back. Uh, if there are things we don't get in this bill that we want to continue to work on, we can come back next year. There's certainly, there's certainly nothing in the bill that says this is now set in stone for the next 30 years. In fact, I would imagine that it will continue to get work done. We, none of us know what kind of technology might exist. Uh, five or ten years from now, so uh, it, it, we're going to be we will have an annual possibility to come back uh, and you know tweak or even make major changes uh, to the bill. Um, so, so when I say it's imperfect, uh, you know, um, I am I am sort of uh, comforted by the fact that uh, yes, we'll, we'll always be able to come back and keep at it. I mean, I see I see frankly. One of my roles here in this job, uh, as to, and I have since I got here six or seven years ago, uh, you know, to be poking and prodding, uh, you know, Dominion, APCO, and everyone else, um, and, and just, you know, pushing, be, a, be an agent of, you know, of change and you know, just keep pushing. Uh, and that, we're not going to pass this bill and stop. We're not going to pass this bill and stop. And one thing I, I haven't heard anyone talk about, and I think is particularly exciting. Um, and it's one of those things we're going to keep, you know, we can kind of keep, keep cranking, uh, is that there are actually rules built into this bill that require competition finally coming to Virginia. Uh, one of the, you know, a lot of the folks at the table are, are, you know, are companies that are dying to come to Virginia, uh, and really ignite our solar industry. Uh, but right now, the way things work, they really can. And there are requirements, uh, as, as we move toward, um, renewables here in Virginia, that uh, you know, 35% of the power being produced can be produced by people, entities other than Dominion. Um, so we're going to have new players coming into the market in Virginia, and you can be sure that as they start to be successful, they're going to continue to press to 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 do more and more. So as I said earlier, I think we're part of a big part of what I see the VCA doing is unleashing market forces that right now are stifled. Um, and if we can start to, you know, open, you know, unleash those forces, uh, I, I, frankly, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I think we can do this even faster than 2045. None of the bill says we can't go faster than 2045. It just sets very strict, you know, deadlines by which it must happen. Well, here, here's a question. Um, we have a couple of questions on this. We've gotten a lot of questions, and I'm trying to group some of them together. I, I would pose this uh, to you, Bob, with maybe help from Harrison. Uh, the, the, I'll read the first sentence of one question and then paraphrase several others. Uh, the assertion from one of the callers that any real change in Virginia 
requires a change in the monopoly rules and central generation. Uh, in other words, until we deregulate uh, the uh, electricity grid dominated by Dominion, will we ever have a just uh, and clean system? Uh, so, uh, Bob, do, do you do you agree that um, the system needs to be deregulated, or are we proving in Virginia that you can move toward clean, affordable energy even with a regulated uh, monopoly like Dominion? Well, that is a fantastic question, and, and Sierra Club has has frankly kind of weighed uh, weighed that one over over the years. Um, and you see bills even in this session that um, that take a look at the monopoly and, and the regulatory framework. And you know, I think we're of, of, of improving it. Um, but I think what you know, at least the chapter, uh, just, you know, as we've weighed this over the past several months, what we've come to is the uh, the conclusion that we have the regulatory framework we have now. Let's optimize it and um, and the SCC oversight. I think Harrison mentioned this in, in his talk uh, because that has been neutered over the past several years, and it's important to have real regulation. And I think if if we do that, and with many of the provisions that uh, Delegate Sullivan was talking about in terms of um, mandating, you know, competition. Uh, especially in the solar space, but even a little bit in the wind space. Uh, that is not something we've seen before. I think that's really worth a try. Um, and, of course, if that, you know, if it doesn't work out, we can look at the regulatory framework. But I, I think a realistic Virginia right now uh, would lead us to that conclusion that uh, let's, let's make the framework work better uh, for Virginians versus trying to, uh, to undo it, which I don't think would have a lot of support in the GA uh, today anyway. Harrison, here's a question I'll direct to you, and maybe Delegate Sullivan, you can um, add a response. Uh, the question is literally, um, both the State Corporation Commission and the Virginia Attorney General have stated this bill is bad for consumers. What's your response, Harrison? So, well, one, my response is that with, you know, they were looking at the Senate bill, so adding this stronger EERS, um, new was a bit of what the SEC said. Um, you know, $17 a month saved really brings down that number um, that they threw out there, $23 um, a month by 2027, an increased cost. Um, also, with the SEC, they said that Reggie was going to cost $12 a month um, just last year, um, and now they've dropped that down to you know under $2. So, again, it's like until something happens, they're – what they want to do is say, you know, that's going to cost too much because that's, I mean, that's their job is to try to uh, warn us away from, from uh, investing in too many new things, um, even though we have a climate crisis to deal with. Um, and the attorney general's estimate on when, um, you know, we're continuing to try to improve that bill and improve that part of what is happening in the Commonwealth um, around uh, the new wind generation that's going to be coming off our coast. Um, the bill does have more competitive procurement. And as they mentioned, those costs are a worst-case scenario. I think it's going to be a lot cheaper by the time those turbines go in the water in a few years. And this allows for a competitive process and a cost cap um, from keeping it from getting to be uh, way overblown. And in this bill, we also got rid of the basis point adder for wind, which was just an extra bonus that Dominion didn't need, which can save a billion dollars on those costs. So those are just a few ways that we're trying to make sure that we're dealing with that. And then, again, hopefully in, fu in the future version of this bill and with you all's help in pushing uh, for more action to protect ratepayers, we'll see even more SEC oversight. Yeah, Mike, this is Rip. Let me, let me make, I think, three points. One, I think uh, Harrison was, was, was um, describing earlier the PIP program with a lot of, a lot of protections in, in here uh, for particularly uh, low-income low um, low Virginians. Second, one of the things that I happen to think is one of the most important parts of, of uh, this bill, it doesn't get a lot of pub, uh, is that we are writing in the code that the FCC, is, as it oversees this transition, uh, is now required by the General Assembly to consider the social costs of carbon. 
um, as it as it helps shape this program going forward. That's never you know, the SEC usually has these blinders on and you know just looks at you know cost to produce what's happening to the rates. So uh, and that's sort of related to my third point. That, uh, a similar question was asked. Uh, when when the SEC came in and, and, and gave some testimony about the cost of this, and one of my colleagues leaned into his microphone uh, and asked, well, what's the cost of doing nothing? Um, and that's sort of where we are, right? We, we, um, we are, this existential crisis we're facing uh, is, is not to say that we should raise everyone's rates and bills in order to solve it, but there are going to be uh, you know, there are going to be some costs associated with it. We happen to think they're going to be a lot less than some of the naysayers are saying. I've, I've spent a lot of time with the people uh, in, the, in the wind space. Uh, and what's happening all around the world uh, in terms of the cost of wind coming down is really dramatic. It's like, it's like we see in so many industries, it's expensive at first, and then it comes down. Look at, look at solar, right? Solar, solar now versus solar 10 years ago is dramatically reduced. So, um uh, I, I, we are very mindful of the ratepayer in this in this bill, uh, both at the, frankly across the spectrum and, and, and certainly at the lower socioeconomic part of the spectrum, um, and really confident that, that in the final analysis, this is going to be a uh, something that saves people saves people money, and obviously at the same time, it's going to help us save the planet. Mike, let me ask you. I'm running out of time here. If you could maybe give me one last question. I, I've sort of got to run. Um, is there something that, that uh, a bunch of people have asked that maybe I can I can answer? Yeah, we have about 50 questions saying, why are you such a tremendously great legislator, uh, Delegate <laughs> Bolvin? <laughs> um, I, I, well, I'll tell you I'll tell you one question that comes up a lot, and and um, maybe you can answer it, uh, and along with your with your friends on, on, on the, this panel, but um, how does the Virginia Clean Economy Act affect the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline uh, for frack gas? Does the Clean Economy Act restrict them or set, sunset them in any way, or does it in any way grandfather them in exempting them from regulation? Uh, the, the a lot, answer a lot is of people no. concerned about the pipeline. Yeah, um, the answer is no. It doesn't exempt. It doesn't exempt them at all. Um, my, my answer to that, and I'll let Harrison and Bob uh, chime in, um, is sort of a return to what I was saying before. Um, you know, we we are changing the economics of energy in Virginia, um, and. Uh, you, you know, if you could fast forward to 2050 now, um, uh, you know, we can't we can't see 2050 yet. Um, but if we could, uh, the plan what we're trying to put in place is a, is, a, is an economy that's not going to need and will not not a not going to need and b would make pipelines uh, like uh, Mountain Valley and Atlantic Coast pipelines um, uneconomic uh, to, to build. And uh, you know, frankly, I think the economics of those pipelines is, is, is disintegrating before Dominion's eyes. Great. Well, Delegate Sullivan, we, we will let you um, we'll, we will let you go, Harrison and Bobby. If y'all could hang on for a couple more questions, but uh, Delegate Rip Sullivan, uh, Chief Patron of the Virginia Clean Economy Act, Chair of the Labor and Commerce Committee, uh, Chair of the Democratic Caucus in the House. Thank you for all the time that you have put into this bill for your legacy of fighting climate change and for all the uh, future victories we'll have in other parts of the economy in solving climate change. Thank you so much for your help. Well, thank you, Mike and Bob and Harrison. It's been great being with you and for everyone on the phone. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, this this is a team game. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and happy to do what I'm doing, but this just doesn't work without without, as I said earlier, an entire state or even beyond the borders of our state. Uh, I, I know everyone on this line is trying to get us to the same place, and I'm grateful for everyone's, everyone's help. Bear down and focus for another, for another week, week and a half, uh, and I'm really, really uh, optimistic that we 
can that we can make this happen. So uh, not time that we can't celebrate yet. So so keep those keep those calls and letters and 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 uh, emails coming. Thank you so much, Delia. Great being with you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you. Sure. Bye-bye. Um, thank you, Harrison and Bob. I, 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 we have a number of questions about the issue of biomass. Uh, I want to read part of one question. Uh, it says the Virginia Grassroots Coalition applauds your Herculean efforts to negotiate this bill. It includes many great items. However, we are concerned about newly added provisions to the engrossed bills that grant millions of dollars of ratepayer subsidies annually to biomass-fired industrial facilities for paper mills owned by Westrock and won by International Paper. These companies and only these companies can profit from burning biomass under the VCEA's RPS requirements. Um, does this questioner have it right? What sort of limitations uh, uh, and features are applied to the issue of biomass under this bill. Harrison, why don't you go first? So what I'll say is that we are, one, we're shutting down every Dominion biomass plant by 2028. Um, existing biomass does have a role in the RPS. It is a shrinking role and one um, that I think, especially once we, once we get to the point to where Reggie starts covering biomass, um, will just shrink more and more each year because, again, we're not letting anything new in. There's nothing coming in from out of state um, in this RPS. Um, but, yeah, but, yeah, the stuff that is already in the state um, as, as of this year has a, has a small role that is slowly getting constrained by all the other market forces that come into reducing carbon, uh, which biomass does produce. Um, and I guess the only thing, I, the only other thing I really add to it is that I think it'll, it'll take us a few years to get to the point to where, uh, you know, New York, uh, California, and some other like huge leaders on climate are, as all of them had to take those steps too. Um, but as we're seeing, I think even in Maryland, where they're they're carving out um, anything left in their RPS is bad. There's there's a place for us to make sure that this stuff goes away. We're committed to fighting it. And we made sure in this bill that we're not incentivizing anything new or anything from out of this state uh, that falls into that category uh, being a part of our clean energy future. Yeah, this is Bob. Harrison has it exactly right. And I, I just want to underline the point that we're putting these companies out of business. And that's hard to put into legislation, right? I mean, they, they have a lot more lobbyists than we have with Harrison and me and a, and a merry, merry band of, uh, of nonprofit lobbyists that, that are in that building. Uh, and it's, it's just miraculous, in my opinion, that uh, we, we've actually been able to phase out all of those companies from doing business in Virginia over a fairly short number of years, despite their, their lot. Look at it both ways. That Yes, there's, a, there's an allowance for a certain period of time for these companies, but I'd look at it the other way. It says you know, we have negotiated basically an end to these businesses uh, in, in business-friendly Virginia in the name of clean energy. So, I, you know, I think it's um, that particular piece of the bill I actually think is a, is a very good compromise. Great. And I will say that we are now at 9 o'clock, um, and we have not been able to get to everyone's questions, but I hope uh, listeners will – agree with us that we presented top questions uh, that go to the heart of some of the criticism of the bill, as well as some of the praise um, that we've tried to address some of the major issues related to the bill in terms of ratepayer protections, in terms of the MVP and ATP pipelines, uh, in terms of moratorium, uh, uh, in terms of the RPS and, and biomass. We have tried to candidly and truthfully and honestly as advocates um, talk about the uh, features of the bill, uh, uh, which are overwhelmingly positive. Again, you can learn more at tcanactionfund.org. Uh, read a thoughtful uh, blog post by, by Harrison Wallace uh, that, that describes the Virginia Clean Economy Act as well as uh, some of the features of the Green New Deal. 
um, and that we are moving forward uh, with a with a good bill uh, that will not be perfect, but will be uh, a game changer, as uh, Delegate Sullivan said, and that we fully intend in 2021 and 2022, and for as long as it takes to come back year after year and improve features of the bill, expand the reach of clean energy in Virginia to cover transportation and uh, degasifying buildings and all the things we know we need to do. Uh, but as we like to say, as part of this coalition uh, in the Clean Energy Economy Initiative, um, to win the race, you need a vehicle. Uh, and this is an incredible uh, initial vehicle. As Harrison said, this is the best first step that any state in America has taken on climate change. I can say that Mike Tidwell, Regional Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, I can say that because I've worked on uh, campaigns in Maryland, in D.C., uh, and on Capitol Hill, and I am in touch with state and regional director, directors across the country in California, Washington State, New York State, and no state, no blue state that has gotten out of the block ahead of Virginia has ever passed a first omnibus bill to get into the race as strong as the Clean Economy Act. Um, and again, I hope that if you're a supporter, you'll continue to support, you'll continue to call and email your legislators. There will be additional email alerts going out from League of Conservation Voters, Virginia Conservation Network, CCAN, Sierra Club, all these many groups that support the bill. We will keep you updated on what you can do to make your voice heard to support the bill. And if you come to this call skeptical about the bill, I hope that you will consider how head-on we've addressed some of the criticisms and how Harrison and Delegate Sullivan and Bob Shippey of Sierra Club have had thoughtful answers to all the questions. We have not been able to get to all the questions, but we have gotten to the major themes of most of the questions. And I hope that you'll, you'll contemplate the answers. Feel free to email us at secanactionfund.org uh, or info at secanactionfund.org. Uh, if we weren't able to get to your question, we'd be happy to provide a written answer as best we can. Uh, and we want to thank you for your time. Uh, all of you who've called in from all over the state, uh, and we look forward to working with you moving forward. Uh, thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Bob. And everyone, have a great evening. Good night.